Hello again, friends. Time for another in other news. And we got some big ass action news coming out of the Pacific, which has not crossed your radar, my friends, but it's crossed other people's radars, namely the Chinese Navy's radars and lots of other folks that are interested in where the next potential interstate conflict is going to occur. And you heard it here first, it's going to occur in the Pacific Ocean. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the tension between China and Japan and China and other Southeast Asian nations make it an easy call to point out that the next state-to-state -state conflict will occur somewhere in the Pacific and it will occur on the water. Let's go specifically to Japan, though, to talk about some events that happened this week that I think are of crucial essence to understanding not just Japan and not just China and not just the Japanese-Chinese relationship, but the greater Pacific realm as a whole that has great potential for flashpoint for conflict. Let's entitle this one, mostly focused on Japan, Super Shinzo is set for some Sino slamming. <laughs> love the alliteration, the alliteration, much like I love Run DMC. Now, first off, let's talk about the words in my title there. Who's the Super Shinzo? Man, this guy's on fire right now. I'm talking about the Prime Minister of Japan, one Shinzo Abe. Uh, spelled like Abe, like uh, Abe Lincoln, Shinzo Abe. In fact, here's a picture of Shinzo, boom, bam, in the current edition of Foreign Affairs, best periodical in this country. Uh, and Shinzo Abe, the conservative center-right, some may say even further right than just center-right, uh, leader of Japan. He's of the LDP party, for those of you that are keeping track of Japanese political parties, which is none of you. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party is <laughs> neither liberal nor very democratic sometimes, but the LDP is the center-right political party in Japan, much like, say, the Republican Party uh, in the United States. So he's a conservative guy. He's a pro-law and order guy. He's a pro military guy. And right now, lots of folks like me and others are calling him the Super Shinzo because he is wildly popular in Japan right now. And I think that popularity in conjunction with lots of things that are happening are setting the stage for Japan to become a bit more aggressive on their foreign policy front and possibly even change their constitution to allow them to become more aggressive on the foreign policy front. What am I talking about? I'm throwing way too much stuff at you. I can't help it. It's Friday, and I'm really excited because Shinzo Abe in Japan just unleashed a new battleship. The battleship Izumo. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Who cares? It sounds like a Pokemon character. The Izumo. It is the largest battleship slash warship that Japan has launched since 1945. Okay, wow, that seems like a big deal in and of itself, or maybe it's not, it's just a battleship. I'm telling you, it's a huge, huge deal. Why is that? Well, let me step it back to Shinzo for just a bit more. Why is he so popular all of a sudden? What's his story, and what has this battleship got to do with his attitude towards the future of Japan? and how it might lead to confrontation with other countries, namely China. Well, Shinzo Abe, Super Shinzo, he actually comes from a political dynasty. I believe it was father was prime minister, or it was grandfather, one or the other, it doesn't matter to me. All of them are center-right conservative. All of them have been per fairly pro-military, pro-nationalist. Heart, heart. Felt nationalism, and nationalism is, is when you are very proud of your country, and be like, yes, Japan's awesome! And in this vein, uh, Shinzo and his uh, folks before him, grandfather and father, they have taken kind of a, a much more ardent nationalist approach to how they feel about Japan in terms of their wartime atrocities. Now, Japan was an imperial power, did pretty much try to take over all of Asia, and it kind of did take over major parts of Asia leading up to and during World War II, uh, namely the Korean Peninsula, parts of China, parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, and so there's still kind of remnant bad blood between Koreans and Japanese and Chinese and Japanese because of that wartime legacy. Because of that legacy, 
once the United States bombed Japan into submission at the conclusion of World War II, the Americans uh, came in, leveled the place, then came in and actually occupied Japan under one General MacArthur and said, okay, grab a pen, uh, Japanese people. We're going to rewrite, you're going to rewrite your constitution according to us. Now, they wrote a constitution that redid their legal system and government system and all this uh, other stuff. Uh, I don't care about any of that. The only thing I want you to think about is the Article 9 of their constitution, uh, which says Japan takes away from itself the right for offensive capability in their military. So Japan actually does not even have a military. They don't got one. They have a self-defense force. Self-defense force. What's the difference between a self-defense force and a military? Because if you look at the Japanese self-defense force, it looks pretty tough. Uh, they got soldiers, they got uniforms, they got guns, they got tanks, they got aircrafts, they got jets, they got missiles, they got rockets, they got battleships. And they got top of the line of all this stuff. Japan is a rich country and their, their self-defense force is one kick-ass self-defense force slash military. So what's the difference? Well, other countries' militaries have offensive capability. They can strike first. They can do a preemptive strike. The United States loves doing preemptive strikes. It's mostly what we do. So the Japanese do not have that capacity. Article 9 of their constitution limits them to a self-defense force, which means all they can do is defend the islands from attack. Someone has to attack them first. They can do nothing. Legally, constitutionally, they can do nothing. They can't even help out allies like the United States. They can't do anything unless they are attacked, and then their only job at that point is to defend the Japanese islands, to repel the attackers from the Japanese islands. Uh, this is important to note when I pulled in the word allies, because if the United States, a staunch, strong ally of Japan, happen to have battleships in the region, say happen to have a bunch of ground troops in South Korea, which they do, if the United States had a force anywhere in the Pacific and say North Korea attacked the Americans, even though Japan is number one ally of the United States, Japan's constitution bars them from even helping the United States. So this is problematic, especially from the United States standpoint. So the U.S. might have coached them into putting this Article 9 into their constitution, but pretty much ever since then, the U.S. has wanted them to get rid of Article 9 of their constitution. What's that got to do with Shinzo Abe? Shinzo Abe wants to get rid of Article 9 of their constitution. Shinzo Abe, again, an ardent nationalist, wants Japanese pride back. He wants Japanese offensive capability back. He wants a strong Japan. He sees a strong offensive military as a key to regaining Japanese strength and respect in the Asian hood. His father wanted it. His grandfather wanted it. And on top of that, Shinzo Abe and his kinfolk have been, mm, uh, let's say, not so prone to be politically correct about World War II either. Basically, they're of the opinion that, yes, Japan committed a bunch of wartime atrocities, Yes, we did some bad stuff. Yes, we pissed off our Asian neighbors. But we're over it. Uh, Shinzo Abe and his crew are tired of apologizing. Again, this is not me. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm saying they're tired of the apologist stance of Japan. And they're saying, look, we sinned in the past 60 years ago. We have paid the dues. We've apologized. We've paid people back. It's over. We're not going to play second fiddle anymore. We want a strong Japan again, even if it's slightly offensive to our neighbors, which it would be. Now, there has been talk in the past about changing Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. Uh, the LDP, again, that center-right political party, has brought this up in the past. This is not new. Most Japanese people have not supported it, though. Most Japanese people still say, hey, we don't want to offend our neighbors. We did do bad stuff 100 years ago, all the way up to World War II. We don't want offensive capability. We just want to be able to defend the island and nothing else. I don't know the numbers, but let's say it's at best 50-50. Uh, half the people want to change the Constitution, other half don't. Probably closer to say it's 60-40, that 60% don't want to change the Constitution, maybe 40 do. This is coming into great effect here in the modern era, though, because more and more people are talking about it more than ever before including the current Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, who's back in power. BTW, he was Prime Minister like six years ago and only lasted eight months before he quit. Complete failures first go-round, completely successful this go-round, and that brings the story full Shinzo circle to what I'm talking about. 
that looks like for the first time since the Japanese surrender in World War II that Japan may actually change this constitutional clause and may give themselves the offensive first strike capability again. Why am I saying that? Because Shinzo and his political party are wildly popular right now. That's why we're calling him Super Abe or Super Shinzo. He's invigorated the Japanese economy, which hasn't happened for 20 freaking years. Uh, How has he done it? By something called the Abenomics <laughs> or Abeonomics, whatever you want to call it. Infusing tons of capital and tons of money from the government into the economy to get people invigorated, to get people spending and giving low rate loans out, basically taking the interest rate to zero and saying, go, 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 Japanese people, go, Japanese business people, go in, uh, invest, start new businesses, spend, consume, get the economy juiced up. The Japanese stock market, the Nikea index, which has been basically flatlined for two or three decades, is up big time in the last six months. This is as rejuvenated as the uh, uh, Japanese economy has been in memory, in a 10 or 20 year memory. So everybody's pretty fired up and jazzed up in Japan right now that Abe's policies are kind of working and that he's pulling back this Japanese pride thing and saying, we're tired of apologizing. We are a leader. We're the third biggest economy on planet Earth. We want to be back on top again. We're going to juice up the economy, bring back national pride, and here's how we're going to do it. Let's launch a battleship. And now we're going to get to the Sino slamming part. What's all this got to do with China? And why would Japan suddenly, since 1945, be launching their biggest battleship and talking about redoing their constitution? Because they feel seriously threatened by China over what? 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 Is China going to invade? No. It's over a group of rocks called the Senkaku Islands. You've heard me rage about this in podcasts of the past. The Senkaku Isles, uh, or the Daiyu, uh, depending on if you're Chinese or Japanese, are claimed two different names for the same group of rocks claimed by both countries. Currently under Japanese control, uh, China is making a claim that historically they are theirs and they want them back. Uh, it, uh, here's a picture of them. They're of no great account, no great value. They're small little rocks, but they are very close to the Chinese coast and the Ch Chinese consider this a strategic threat. Why? Why would China consider this a strategic threat? It's just a group of rocks. Who cares if China or Japan owns them? Well, to uh, uh, stick up for the Chinese on this one, what could the Japanese do on that small group of rocks? Well, you could put a bunch of ballistic missiles pointed at the Chinese coast there. Oh, God. How preposterous. How unheard of. Never in the history of man has a small island been armed with weapons pointed at a major world power. That's preposterous. <laughs> 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis is what China's thinking about. So China feels extremely threatened by Japanese ownership of this small group of rocks off their coast. They want them back. And both countries, both countries, are whipping up nationalistic furor, uh, that is national pride taken to an extreme, in order to rally the, the, the populace and the troops behind the government in this claim to either hold or take these islands back. You are looking at a possible flashpoint between the world's second and third largest economies, where it may be an actual naval skirmish over a group of rocks. I say the likelihood of a war breaking out at this point in the next year to two years is 50-50. And that is a high odds for a major battle between two world powers. And it could go down over these rocks, and this is why. So that's why I want to talk about this in other news. The launching of the battleship Izumo is actually fairly important. It is a definite, definite sign from the Shinzo Abe administration that they are serious. They feel that they want to regain their status and get respect back in the Pacific, that they're not to be trifled with, and that yes, they know China's way bigger and way better, but they are not going to let go of those islands without a fight and a possible real fight with possible real bullets being exchanged between naval powers. Japan looks set for the first time in a long time to change their constitution so that they can regain some naval supremacy in the Pacific. 
By the way, BTW, who's all in favor of this? That would be your good friends here in the United States of America who have long wanted Japan to scrap that Article 9 of their Constitution so that they could support the United States and all the United States endeavors, not just in the Pacific, but in other parts of the world. The Japanese Constitution currently bans them from helping the United States in any capacity whatsoever, and that looks set to change. Booyah! Does that make more sense? Uh, the last thing I want to add on this is that we're also now, I think, starting to look at a definite policy of Chinese containment. And the Chinese definitely think that's what's going on. Okay, what's containment? Well, it was the official policy of the United States and their allies during uh, the Cold War. Containment means uh, we weren't going to fight the Ruskies uh, head on. We weren't going to start a war with the Soviets during the Cold War. Uh, that's why it was cold. Uh, but we're going to make allies and friends and strengthen all our allies and friends all around the Soviet Union as much as possible. You strengthen your hand in the vicinity so that you effectively contain your enemy from making any major moves, or at least contain them from spreading out their influence and true power. Be it naval power, be it air power, be it economic power. I think we are definitely seeing a coordinated effort now by the U.S. and its allies for a policy of Chinese containment. And I'll end with this. Pull out a map and take a look at it. Where are U.S. allies in the Pacific region. Huh. Okay, let's center up. There's China. Let's see. Our good friends Japan, where there's somewhere between 50 and 60,000 U.S. troops and a bunch of battleships, who were encouraging to have an offensive capability. Japan, South Korea, U.S. ally. Taiwan, South Korea, ally. Philippines, South Korea, ally. ally. I'm sorry, Philippines, uh, U.S. ally. Uh, South Korea, U.S. ally. Uh, Vietnam, an increasing U.S. ally, the country we went to war with uh, uh, several decades ago. Uh, Indonesia, U.S. ally. Oh, wait a minute, stop there. China, all U.S. allies. Are you starting to see the policy of containment and why China is pushing back, maybe wants those islands back, maybe wants islands in the South China Sea back? China is also currently claiming the entire South China Sea. That's for a separate podcast. So what we have here is a classic, classic Battle of the 21st century that's coming up is going to be about water. It's going to be about naval supremacy in the Pacific of a growing China that's going to continue to grow its capacity on the water. And this move by Japan is no coincidence whatsoever. This particular battleship, the Izumo, is supposedly not an aircraft carrier, but it'll hold 15 helicopters. <laughs> supposed to be for emergencies only, to help with stuff. Uh, yeah, how fast do you think the uh, Japanese could retrofit that to hold jets? I think about five seconds. So we're looking at raw power being exerted now by Japan, and watch them, watch closely, follow the news, let's see what they do if they start talking about that constitutional art, uh, Article 9, which limits their capacity to float those boats around other places than Japanese territory, perhaps to help out their U.S. allies and others. Good story, good stuff. You understand it? Cool. Got any questions? Hit me up and hit it, run.